So I'm going to use, there are many different cultural uh, myths and cultural um, re religious uh, ideologies that I could have went to to discuss the story of the sun, but I'm choosing the Egyptian culture because I think it's probably the clearest example. This is one of the gods of ancient Egypt known as Horus. Horus, H-O-R-U-S. Horus was known as the golden falcon in Egyptian cosmology. He was the sun god, the solar disk that rises in the east and makes, he flies across the sky in, in, his, in an arc. Okay? He, he flies across the sky in his solar arc. He makes an arc across the sky until he reaches the west at sunset. So Horus is a golden bird. He's a bird that is, that is gold, the falcon, and he makes his trek across the sky daily. The word horizon is, uh, it means the zone of Horus. Hori, H-O-R-I, is the genitive or the possessive word for Horus. It means Horuses or of Horus. Zone, the horizon, the zone of Horus. That's where Horus appears during the day, on the horizon. The horizon. He makes his trek across the sky and then he goes into the west at sunset. Okay? So Horus has three main family members that you need to understand the role that they play in this story. He has a mother, a father, and a brother. His mother is depicted here, Isis. Isis is the goddess of the night sky in Egyptian cosmology. She is often also identified as the moon goddess. So at night, when the sun is not up, the moon is the queen of the heavens. She rules the night sky. The, her cloak is the dark cloak that the stars are embedded in. Okay? So she's the goddess of night and the, the goddess, the moon is her, her presence when the moon is out and you see it at night. So this dark feminine moon goddess that also represents the cloak, the black cloak of the night sky with all the stars embedded in it, each day gives birth to the rising sun. She gives birth to God's sun. The sun that is owned by the God of the heavens, Osiris, the father God, the creator God. Horus is the son of Osiris. He is the creator God's son. Here you see the solar disk above his head and the divine mother, Isis, gives birth each day to the solar God when the, the, the sun is born of the night sky. Horus is depicted right here. He is, he is touching Osiris on his right temple. His dark brother, Set, depicted right here, okay, is touching Osiris in this picture on his left temple. This is the idea of conscience. This is the idea that Horus is the right mind. He is the connection to the right brain. See, he's touching Osiris on his right side of the brain hemisphere. So this is moral action. He's the male principle that's born of the feminine principle of emotions. Right? This is the goddess of emotion, the feminine goddess, the Holy Spirit, our emotions. And our emotions are what give birth to proper moral action. So he is the light of the sky. He's touching the right brain, right? On the left, you have the god of darkness. He's known as Set in the Egyptian uh, uh, pantheon of gods, in Egyptian cosmology. Set is the one who comes at night when the sun is setting. This is where we get the word set the sun set from, and he conquers the light. He conquers Horus, and darkness prevails. So this is, this is one who is in ignorance, if one is in worship of Set. This is the dark god. It's associated with darkness, ignorance, and the light going out. 
And look, he's touching the left brain, which tells you if you're too left brain, your actions are not in moral rightness. You're not in the light, you're in the darkness, when the light is put to death. So, this is like the concept of the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other shoulder of conscience. One's whispering in your ear to do the wrong thing, one's whispering in your ear to do the right thing. And Horus was known as, he's a god of, of uprightness, of righteousness, the savior of the world, the god of light, the solar disk. And Set is the god of darkness that conquers the light. So you see here the trinity. Osiris is our thoughts. Isis, our emotions. And Horus and Set, our actions. One is born of moral uprightness, and one is a god of darkness and ignorance. It's a, a, a beautiful moral um, symbolic analogy. If we take it as an expression of consciousness symbolically and not as physical gods in the sky. So here we see another statue from ancient Egypt of um, Osiris, the middle pillar, our thoughts, and then you have Horus, the male principle of action, alongside Isis, the feminine lunar goddess of emotion. Here you have again the Yang principle, the yin principle and the mixture between the two. The coming together of the male and the female. Or thought, emotion and action coming together as one. So here on the left we see Horus uh, as the child with his mother Isis and on the right we see the, the uh, comparable image of Mary with the, uh, the Madonna with the child of, of Jesus. Now there, there's a, a couple of reasons why they are uh, a virgin goddess and they give birth to a male child that is not born of a male sexual union, a union with a uh, sexual union with a male. The reason for that is Isis represents the intuitive brain. She represents the midbrain where conscience and intuition come from. When one conquers the reptile brain and is getting in touch with the right brain of conscience and into of conscience and intuition, one has conquered the, the, the father, the controller part of the brain, the oldest part of the brain, the reptile brain, and it is a virgin birth. The 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 Feminine limbic brain is giving birth to the neocortex, the divine male child of proper moral action into the world. So it's a it's a virgin birth. We're going to see how even that idea is 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 covered over by astrotheological uh, ideas, and it's it's just looked at as that's the place where the sun is born in the zodiac, which we'll get into. And look at this these images of Mary. Uh, depicted as the queen of heaven with her crown on in each example. She is the moon goddess. She wears the dark cloak with the stars embedded in it. The cloak of the night sky with the stars. And in each example, here in this example, you actually see the crescent moon at her feet. She is the lunar goddess. And in each example, she is giving birth to the child of Light, enlightenment, the moral solar principle of proper moral action. Here you see Jesus depicted as laying on uh, hay, which is actually the radiant rays of the sun. Here you see him coming out from beneath the cloak of the heavens being born, the night sky bearing the soul, uh, solar male child during the day. And here you see from her cloak, here is the sacred heart of Jesus being born in the flames of the sun. So in every example, you're seeing the queen of heaven, the night sky, the lunar goddess, giving birth to the, the child of moral action, the sun. Now, to understand how the story of consciousness, which is Christianity, it, it actually, there is a real religion of Christianity underneath the astro-theological 
uh, 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 trappings of it that it is wrapped in to sell as a binding. And that's it. It is the story of how proper moral action is given birth to in the world. It's given, it's a, it's a virgin birth because the R complex has been conquered. The limbic brain is our intuitive brain that, that governs our emotions and we feel that those emotions and so it helps to give birth to the, the properly balanced neocortex, the savior of the world. So, to understand the story as an astrotheological metaphor, we have to understand two basic concepts in astronomy that aren't too complicated. One is what creates the seasons of the year, and the other is what is the procession of the equinoxes. So I'll take the first one, what creates our seasons? Our seasons are created simply because of the tilt of the earth in relation to the plane that it orbits our sun in. That's all. It is, has nothing to do, the earth doesn't vary in great distance uh, from the sun as it makes its journey around it during the year. It's, it's a, 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 it is a slightly elliptical orbit, for, but for our intents and purposes we can consider it as a circle. So it has nothing to do with distance from the sun. It is simply the tilt of the Earth on its own axis of rotation. That's the only thing that really creates our seasons. So let's look at this. Here the Sun is at the, the um, I'll start at the autumn equinox. The autumn equinox, the Sun is directly at the equator of the Earth. Okay, so see that angle that the sun is making with the equator of the earth? It's right at the equator, right at that point. Okay? So the sun is right at the equator, zero degree, no, no angle. It's the, if you went to the equator, look straight up, at that day, the sun is right at the equator. It's not in the northern hemisphere, it's not in the southern hemisphere. As the sun makes, as the earth makes its journey around the sun, later in the year, it arrives at the winter solstice. And you see that the tilt of the Earth doesn't change as it goes around this, this plane of, the, uh, uh, of its orbit. Here, it's making an, an, a different angle with respect to the Sun. So look at where the Sun is striking the Earth at. It's striking the Earth in the Southern Hemisphere. Here's the equator, here's the Northern Hemisphere, here's the Southern Hemisphere. So the angle that it's making is toward the southern hemisphere. So the sun started here and now it went down to here. So now at this point, the winter solstice, the sun is now at a 23.5 degree south angle. The next uh, time of the year is the spring equinox and the sun has now moved from its southerly position and it's gone back to the equator. So it is back at a zero degree mark with relationship to the sun. Then we get, we go toward the spring season and to the summer solstice, the beginning of summer. So at this point we see here's the equator of the earth, here is the sun and here's the angle that it's striking the earth at and we see that now it's in the northern hemisphere. It's striking the earth at a 23.5 degree north angle. So now the, the northern hemisphere is favored by the sun during the season and that's why it's the beginning of summer for us. When the southern hemisphere is favored by the sun here, that's summer in the southern hemisphere and winter in the northern hemisphere. Okay. So that is what creates the seasons. The tilt of the earth with respect to uh, its, its plane of orbit around the sun. And essentially we can look at this a different way. We can just look at it as here's where the angle with the, earth, uh, with the sun starts. If I am the earth and the sun is directly out from the equator, this is the autumn equinox. Okay? At the winter solstice, it goes down by 23.5 degrees. Spring equinox, it comes back up. Summer solstice. Autumn equinox, winter solstice, spring equinox, 
summer solstice. And this process just keeps repeating like a sine wave as the seasons go on. It's just up and down, up and down, okay? It's, it's a, like a pendulum movement. So the next concept in astronomy to understand is the precession of the equinoxes. There is another reference frame of motion at work, which I won't get into the, 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 the full mechanics of, but you just need to know that the background of stars behind the solar path, the constellations that make up the zodiac, they're in what's called the solar ecliptic path, they slowly go backwards throughout a very long period of time. They slowly precess counterclockwise, okay? So at the, um, at the spring equinox, okay, the, um, the, 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 the constellation that is in, that the sun is in at the spring equinox over a very long period of time begins to shift and a new constellation comes in and it is behind the sun at the spring equinox. And this keeps going until it makes one complete revolution through the zodiac. So the, the frame of reference that, of what the Earth is, the pole of the Earth is pointing to, actually makes a full circle in the sky. It is not because the Earth itself is wobbling on its axis, but I will not get into what really causes that reference frame. But uh, over a long period of time, approximately 25,000 years, a complete circle is made, and at the spring equinox, every constellation has been gone through until you come back to the first one. So that's called the precession of the equinoxes. So just keep that in mind. You don't need to fully understand that right now, just keep it in mind. So this is the story that the ancients told about the sun on the wheel of the zodiac. This is the zodiac. Uh, it has all the constellations that the sun goes through during its course of the year. The ancients would quarter this to create the seasons. So they placed a cross over the zodiac wheel and they looked at it as these three constellations are the spring season. These three are when the sun is in the summer season. These three are the autumn season, and these three are the winter season. Okay, the ancients then placed the sun on the cross of the zodiac, and they would tell its story of its journey through the, the, the houses of the zodiac, through the constellations during the course of a, a year. So I'm going to start where we begin our zodiacal year, in Aries at the spring equinox. So the sun here is at zero degrees. It is at the equator and it's starting to make its journey up northward into the northern hemisphere. So during these six months the sun's in the northern hemisphere. During these six months the sun is in the southern hemisphere. So here's the point of the zero point and it starts rising. Now when it hits Taurus Taurus, the bull, the midpoint of the spring season, the sun has become a charging bull. He's gaining strength because he's rising in the northern hemisphere. When he hits this point, this is the summer solstice, the sun has gone as high in relation to its angle of the latitude of Earth as he's going to go. So he's at his highest point in the northern hemisphere, 23.5 degrees north latitude of the Earth. This is known as the Tropic of Cancer. That line, the latitude on the Earth, is called the Tropic of Cancer. And because the Sun is entering the house of Cancer, the constellation of Cancer, at that point during the year. Um, this is the summer solstice. It is the longest day of the year as far as light goes because the tilt of the Earth makes the northern hemisphere of the Earth favored. Now, the sun is entering the summer season and he's traveling toward Leo the lion. This is the season that the sun is hottest in the northern hemisphere. He has become a 
roaring lion with a large mane, you know, the solar rays of the sun, the fierce lion. And then the sun makes his journey into Virgo, and that is, uh, after he passes that house, he's at the autumn equinox. Now, he's back at zero degrees now, and he's getting ready to fall into the southern hemisphere. This is why this season is called fall. The sun is making his descent to a another uh, solstice, to its lowest point of power. Okay, so that's the season of fall. Now, this is where the story of Christianity starts to become involved in the telling of the astrotheological story of the sun on the cross of the zodiac. And it is because at this time of the year, when, when the sun is in Virgo, getting ready to make his journey into the southern hemisphere, into Libra, uh, while the sun is in Virgo, in the constellation of Virgo, when, when it is rising at the beginning of the day, there is a constellation beneath the house of Virgo, known as Crux. This is what Crux looks like. It's known as the Southern Cross, only visible from the Southern Hemisphere. So, at this time, the ancients would say that the sun was on top of the cross of crooks. Not right on this, the sun doesn't go into this. The sun is here, it's over top of crooks. Because Virgo is on top of crooks in the night sky. You just need to look at a celestial map. You pinpoint uh, Virgo and then you look lower toward the southern hemisphere and you'll find crooks, the southern cross. So at this time of the year, the ancients said that the sun was placed upon the cross of crooks, the southern cross. And this marked the time that the sun was getting ready to begin to die, begin to go to his lowest point, the winter solstice. So in this season, the sun then passes through Scorpio the scorpion and he is stung by the venom of the scorpion. So now he's really in rapid decline, okay? He's dying quickly because he's, he's uh, stung by the venom and he's dying and then he comes to the winter solstice. Now the sun is at 23.5 degrees south latitude of Earth. He is at the Tropic of Capricorn because he's getting ready to enter the house of Capricorn. This is the Tropic of Capricorn, 23.5 degrees south latitude of Earth. This is when the sun is at his winter solstice, and the, the ancients knew that was as far south as the sun would descend. It's making its lowest arc across the southerly sky that it's going to make, and that's the shortest day of the year as far as light goes. It's the day that is the longest day in darkness. So this is when the sun was said to have died upon the cross of the zodiac. He's at his lowest point of power and he has died upon the cross. So uh, remembering that uh, at the autumn equinox point here is when the sun was placed upon the cross of crooks, the southern cross, and this point here at the winter solstice is when the sun dies on the cross of the zodiac. You see here that it passed through one, two, three zodiac houses to reach that point. This is a symbolic corollary to the story that Jesus hung upon the cross for three hours, three Horus's hours before he expires upon the cross. So in this instance, from the autumn equinox to the winter solstice, these three uh, zodiac constellations are seen symbolically as ours. So at the winter solstice, the sun has reached his lowest point in the southern hemisphere. And um, this is, at this point, the ancients could see with the eye no visible movement of the sun back toward the northern hemisphere for approximately three days. So the winter solstice takes place on December 22nd. For three days, the sun is seen to be uh, stationary 
and its arc is, is staying at the same uh, position and, lo and location in the sky as it rises and sets. It is not until three days later that the sun begins to make its uh, trek northward until that is visible to the naked eye. So the ancients would see the sun rising farther northward and its arc getting somewhat larger on the third day after the winter solstice. And that day, of course, is December the 25th, the birth date of the sun, because that is the day visually the sun can be seen to be, to be born from its place of death in the southern hemisphere and to begin to rise again or start the cycle again of rising and falling during the course of the year. So that is the date when the son, son of God is said to be born and he is born of the virgin. And we talk about what that really means, the, the birth of consciousness, the birth of the neocortex from the, the, the mammalian brain. However, in this context, context astrotheologically, it means that the son is born of Virgo. So that at one point was where the um, the the, con the the zodiac began. It was it was it began at this point the 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 line between Leo and Virgo. So at that point, the sun would be born of Virgo, the Virgin, not of Aries. So if the 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 sun um, the uh, the uh, zodiacal year would begin at this point, it would travel in a circle until it reached. Leo and back to the Leo Virgo line. So if you look at where Virgo is and you count the houses in procession, in the procession of equinoxes, okay, backwards, counterclockwise through the zodiac signs, you get nine months, and that is the human gestation period. The sun, if he is born of Virgo and carried to term for nine months, until he is born at the winter solstice point. So in that instance, the zodiacal houses are seen to be months symbolically. Here we saw them as hours, and here we see them as months, and we're going to see them as days as well. So uh, here we see a zodiac in stone. This is the Virgo, the Virgin, and Leo, the Lion, the Sphinx. It's uh, its position looking east toward the rising sun, and it commemorates the sun being born of the Virgin and the, the, the um, track of the sun through the zodiacal houses until it ends up in Leo at the end of the uh, ancient zodiac. So the Sphinx is simply a zodiac in stone. Now, at the winter solstice, the sun then begins its track northward again, he goes to Aquarius, the water bringer, because the winter uh, uh, frost is beginning to thaw as we approach the spring equinox again. Okay, so that's the bringer of the waters. And then the sun comes back full circle to the spring equinox, the zero point again, when it is back at the, uh, uh, the zero point, the equator. And we see that at the point that he died in the southern hemisphere or in his tomb after being placed on the cross, he's in his tomb of the southern hemisphere and after one, two, three days he comes back to the zero point to begin rising again in the northern hemisphere. So this is the rebirth of the sun, this is the emergence from the tomb of the southern hemisphere to the favored northern hemisphere. And that day is Easter Sunday. And think about the day. East, star, sun, day. All concepts associated with light, the sun, and the sun is a star, it rises in the east, it's up during the day. So Easter Sunday is happens at a different date every year. It happens on the first Sunday, the worship, the day of worship for Christianity is a solar religion, a solar astrotheological religion. And it occurs the first Sunday after the first full moon, because again the lunar moon goddess must become 
full to bear the sun after the spring equinox or the rising of the sun from the spring equinox out of the tomb of the southern hemisphere. So Easter Sunday is always celebrated on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. And this story of the sun savior that has 12 helpers, the 12 constellations of the zodiac, who is the light of the world, the way, the truth, and the life, has uh, um, uh, performs miracles, um, rises from the dead after three days, has a virgin mother, is the son of God. Every one of these um, aspects of this savior story, the savior myth that is told over and over again through time. There are over 40 incarnations of this sun god. Every one of the names that you're about to see scroll by is one of the names of this ancient sun savior figure that comes from the east, is, has uh, miraculous powers, uh, redeems the world through the light, um, again, has 12 helpers, is the son of God, has a virgin birth, performs miracles, etc. Every one of those names is that same savior myth retold, and every one of those names predates Christianity. It predates uh, uh, the first century of the common era, often by thousands of years. Some of those names predate uh, the, the, uh, the time that Jesus uh, was said to have lived by 2,000 or even close to 3,000 years. Now, this is not to negate the understanding, the underlying moral lesson that Christianity has to teach. There is a core of truth. There is a religion that uh, perhaps an enlightened avatar that walked in uh, the land of Galilee at the first century uh, was attempting to uh, bear into the world and really help to awaken minds of his time. And I don't, uh, I don't necessarily um, try to negate that, that uh, it may have been a uh, teacher or a group of teachers. Um, however, I think that the uh, idea has been co-opted and it has been uh, turned into this story of the ancient pagan sun uh, savior myth in order to conceal the true message, the true message of what the virgin birth is, of what the savior of the world is, what indeed the ideology that uh, perhaps an enlightened avatar at that time was trying to teach people and, and, and help to enlighten them to. And therefore the authorities of the time had to shut down that expansion of knowledge and they did it by taking it and perverting it and wrapping it in the old uh, sun worship uh, cult, the, 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 the cult of the unconquerable sun, Sol Invictus. And that's why uh, we see the story of Christianity uh, presented to the masses in the way that it is today. I don't think it negates the true moral lessons that can be gleaned from Christianity, but what we are seeing presented as Christianity and organized religion is certainly not the religion of Christ consciousness, so to speak, of higher levels of awareness, which is what I believe uh, the, the, if you look into the true message of Christ, the true uh, teachings that are encapsulated in his words, uh, I don't think that's what modern Christianity is really teaching people. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, understood uh, that this is what Christianity was, and he brilliantly codified this in his painting of the Last Supper. If we look at the symbolism that's encoded into this painting, we see that we have a dark half of the room and a light half of the room. Okay, so again, this is the concept of the light and the dark. You can look at this as the male uh, aspect, right? You can look at this as the female aspect, right? So the yang energy, the yin energy. Jesus is the perfect blend of the two. He's the middle. He's the chemical wedding, so to speak. He's the savior, the light of the world, of higher consciousness. You see that he sits in the region where the light is really coming into the room because he's the sun. He is surrounded by his 12 helpers or his 12 apostles, the zodiac constellations. You see they're broken into groups of three, right? So this will be the winter season here. 
And then as it as you're rising, this would be the spring season. Okay? Here, you're going toward, I'm sorry, this would be the autumn season, and of course that would be Virgo. Okay? Um, now Virgo is in Virgo is actually in the summer season technically. It's above the line. So th this is the um, this is the um, <clears throat> autumn season. We see that he's surrounded by the twelve um, his twelve helpers, the twelve signs of the zodiac. We see that they're broken into groups of three, each group representing one of the seasons. Here in the dark part of the year, you have uh, winter and you have autumn. And then as you're going toward the light part of the year, summer in the northern hemisphere, here you have spring, this group here is spring, and the far group there is summer. Because uh, you see that the, the part when the, the sun is darkest, that would be winter, and you're, you're going up toward the summer season there. And Jesus is the equinox, he's the perfect balance between the two. So he is the star, or the son of God, at the gate the star gate. And see, there's like chaos in the room. They're, they're not in agreement with each other. They're arguing or there's some conflict. And Jesus has a peaceful countenance on his face because he is the way, the truth, and the life. It's the blending of the male and female to awaken the, the, the prefrontal cortex. And that is the way out of the world of conflict, confusion. And it is the way to the light of the, the world above, um, the connection with the light of the world above. So da Vinci encoded this all brilliantly into the Last Supper, and I think he had a real strong grasp of uh, what Christian, the real message of Christianity was versus what was being uh, sold to us in, uh, in astrotheology.